our chiefs aren't aren't owners of the land; they're caretakers of it. That it's even, in a way, linking to treaty. Uh, that they don't. There isn't even a right to sign away your land. You're only care caring for it. You're given for it as stewards. It, there, we don't even have a, a a word in our language for signing away land. It's illegal. Well, we have no tool for that. Uh, we're caretakers of it, and we're not on top of it in a hierarchy as as another model might 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 show. That is an incredible sight. Incredible, sad at the same time. Seeing a tree as magnificent as this all on its own. Wow. That is absolutely enormous. That is one of the biggest Douglas fir trees I've seen in my life. Now it'd be more. Are we on? You're on. Oh. You guys should join in the conversation. <laughs> we'll join in. Yeah. All right, this is the last forest of its kind? Pretty much, it's the last decent sized track of it. 400 hectares is probably the biggest chunk left. Douglas fir like this. Yes, I don't know of any other area that has this big of trees at this elevation. And on a private land, everything has been logged, so this is extremely rare for private forest land to have any trees of decent size left. So, If we were sitting on crown land or public land right now, this wouldn't even be an issue. We wouldn't be sitting here thinking of, you know, this is the end. We'd be thinking here, wow, are we ever so lucky we can come here forever and share it with our children?
very unique ecosystem here. It's it's what's known as a, a temperate rainforest. So a lot of people, when they think of rainforest, they think of the Amazon and Brazil, but there's also temperate rainforest. It just means it's a, an area that receives more than two meters of rain a year, and it's in a temperate zone. So the coast of uh, North America, from Northern California all the way up to Alaska, is temperate rainforest. Well, this tree that we're sitting in in front of now is called the Hanging Garden Tree, and it's probably about 1,000 to 1,500 years old. And it's a, so that's the very upper end of a, of, a, of a western red cedar's life. And as a western cedar grows really old, it gets a lot of um, what's known as epiphytic growth on it. So there's a lot of other plants growing on this tree. Um, so it's very, very heavily laden at the top with berry bushes and other trees that are growing out of it. So as its life declines, it's providing life for other, other life forms. We have these amazing, huge, old-growth cedars here and uh, a big part of what makes them so big and what feeds them is the wild salmon. There's on average three meters of rain per year here in this area, so it washes the nutrients out of the soil and it also creates um, these amazing rivers that we have at the inlets. And so the wild salmon, they're born in these rivers and they go out to sea and it's quite mysterious. We don't always know where they go. They go pretty far, big distances, and um, they eventually come back and uh, they come to lay their eggs and to die in the same streams that they were born. takes the salmon out of the stream. The salmon uh, is taken into the forest. The leftover parts of salmon decompose and they become food for the trees. The trees actually have salmon DNA in them. Cool. And when the salmon are in the ocean, they eat nutrients that they can only get, food that they can only get in the ocean, that gives them specific nutrients that are only available in the ocean. And then when the salmon ends up in the forest, it gives those special nutrients to the forest. And that's the only way the forest can get those special nutrients. So they're actually called salmon forests because they rely on the salmon. find traces of our people when they've cedar bark stripped or they've taken a, a plank off of the tree and the tree is still living and that plank was used for a house here somewhere. I knew why our people were doing wood like that, just splitting boards off of trees and leaving them living. And They always said that when, when people came here uh, at the age of discovery, they couldn't tell that we were even harvesting cedar and yet we were the cedar people. Every bit of our life, our bowls, tools, implements, clothing, everything, houses, everything was cedar. And everyone that described it coming here was you can't, you couldn't even tell that they were taking trees from this place. As you can see behind me, with this giant red cedar stump that I'm sitting on, 12, 13 feet in diameter, old growth forests are highly endangered in British Columbia. As much as the BC Liberal government contends that they are not, uh, the evidence shows that they are. 75% actually of the productive old growth forests have been logged on Vancouver Island alone, including 90% of the valley bottom old growth where the biggest trees are found or were once found and where the richest wildlife resides. Old growth forests are very important for many reasons. 
they store two to three times more carbon per hectare than the ensuing second growth tree plantations, so they're important for mitigating climate change. They are important habitat for many endangered species across the province, such as mountain caribou in the interior, the spotted owl on the lower mainland, uh, marbled murelets, etc. on Vancouver Island. And we're quickly losing them. South of Barclay Sound, only 4% of the valley bottom productive old growth forest remains. So much like the forest that would have been right here in the Gordon River Valley. actually had the money then they would stop and talk about selling but they won't even talk about selling and saving it to be bought until there's money on the table which actually is very sad to think that money is ruling over society's needs for what's happening in the woods so it's not exactly professional if all they're talking about is money Seems to be the whole way the whole world is going. I think it's just like the last resources are being you know, extracted at the fastest rate. Get it before you can't anymore, and you know, just get the last bits. I'm just looking across this clear cut, and they have a term called green up. You're not supposed to take the next block beside it until it's greened up. But green up is, yeah, I would have assumed, especially when I first got into this stuff, that it meant, you know, above my head trees and, you know, looking pretty, like kind of like a forest starting. But green up is, is measured in years now. That's three. So that can be considered green up next year. Yeah. So when you think, see these lovely words, green up, free to grow. Free to grow is just above your head, and that's considered a forest. So all these nice, you know, oh, you know, we won't log, we aren't clear cutting and we won't do the next block until, it, you know, it's really going good. It's either green up or free to grow. Free to grow is the usual standard on crown. But that's insane. That makes it brown for miles. Especially if you get slopes like that, they're going to get full sun all summer. If we don't have water, what's going to grow? Doesn't matter. Time. Time. <laughs> Now we sit here in a modern context uh, with the colonial state asserting their laws and tenures uh, and we continue to say these are our curtains, our lands, our mountains uh, and uh, we need to learn to work together and uh, there's still a lot of conflict that remains. There's a whole tiny world as well, all the little insects and some that are even too small to see. I mean, um, in the canopies of some old growth trees where you get the big curves in the, in the branches, like the cedars, you get soil deposits up to like a foot, a foot deep um, and giant moss mats. And underneath those moss mats, in those soils, researchers from UVic have discovered um, upwards of 300 new species of arthropods, so mites, spiders, various insects, um, that are totally new to science. And, you know, we, do, we don't have the greatest idea yet how they are involved with forest health or the function in the ecosystem, yet we risk losing them before we even know that they exist, right? So it's not always just the big trees. The big trees are a, are a nice uh, feature of these forests, um, but it's in really, truly an ecosystem the ecosystem that counts from the, the biggest to the smallest things. It's really important that uh, particularly the youth spend time in nature. The majority of children today have nature deficit disorder and um, what better way to uh, 
deal with that then to bring them into nature. And the kids just love it in here. They absolutely love it. And they don't want to see this forest developed. They stand more to gain by having it not developed than we do because they're going to be here longer. For anything you wanted to build out of red cedar, um, you would know what you were going into the woods to, to build. Um, so if it was a canoe, you would look specifically for a canoe tree. Uh, if it was planks for a longhouse, you'd be looking for a, a tree that was perfect for that. So you wouldn't just go into the forest and cut down any old tree. First, um, you would look for a windfall, one that had fallen on its own, and then if you couldn't find that, then you would look for a standing tree. We're standing beside an old growth coastal Douglas fir. Magnificent, very, very thick bark. And it was logged prior to 1939. You can see the mark there where they cut the tree so they could insert the springboard. And this is before we have had the uh, technology that we have now where you can flatten a forest in no time flat. This was done, you know, manually. And um, if they leave this forest alone, every tree in here has the potential to become an old growth tree. And that's what we'd like to see happen. The serenity, uh, the peace, the peace that you can get uh, surrounded by ferns and the trees that are there, uh, the moss, um, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, the feeling of, of connecting to the earth, the clean, the cleanliness of being in there. Uh, it's hard to walk down the sidewalk in the street, in the city, the, the, the fumes of the cars, uh, all the sounds that surround you and the bustle of, this, of the city. Uh, it's all removed and filtered by the forest. You know, it's interesting. I, mean, I remember 20 years ago uh, talking to a campaigner, uh, a forest campaigner, and he said, you know, we're not just talking about protecting pieces of nature and parks. We're talking about protecting the biosphere. And we used to say back then, you know, he, it was a cutting edge idea that humans are part of nature. And it's really hard to see that when you live in a city and you go to a supermarket to get your food, you go to another box to do your work, you go to another box to sleep, and, and it doesn't seem like nature's really involved in it. But if you sit down and think about it, every single thing that we eat, that we wear, that we consume is made out of earth, air, water, and fire. It all comes from nature. And it's an amazing planet that we live on. And, you know, if you start looking around the universe, which we've been looking very hard, we haven't found one other planet like this yet. And if you really start thinking about 
how big our planet is or how small it is, depending on how you want to look at it, and how thin that layer of air is. It's 10 kilometers thick, that's like six miles. How thin the crust is and how it's molten underneath and how there's a very thin layer of water. Uh, and we're just the right distance from the sun that we're not fried and we're not freezing. It is a miracle that we're alive here. And we really need to remember that we won't survive if the biosphere does not survive. That indeed, we are part of it. And it's all species of equal rights. And I think one of the real cutting, uh, cutting edge ideas of our time is the idea of the rights of Mother Earth or the rights of nature. That other species like trees and bears and salmon also have a right to live in the same way that uh, back in the day in European cultures, uh, men had rights and women didn't. Uh, free people had rights and slaves didn't, we've evolved. And I think the next step for European thinking is to kind of get the idea that nature itself has rights. And in fact, if we fail to recognize uh, and respect the rights of nature, we won't have a place to live anymore. And I'm certainly not looking forward to moving to the moon <laughs> in any hurry. <laughs> not looking forward to moving to the moon. <laughs> I like it right here. <laughs>